everybody. My name is Gilda Ross. I'm the Glenbard Student and Community Projects Coordinator. It is a very hot night in Chicago for a very hot and important topic, how to raise a healthy gamer. Dr. Luke Kunojia is here with us. We will be discussing a book. We discussed it at noon today and I took copious notes and I'm ready to take some more because there's so much great information here. And power struggles, break bad screen habits and transform your relationship with your kids. I'm so happy that you could join us tonight. This wouldn't happen without the sponsors who make it all possible and the support of the schools. Thank you for that. Our, our ask of all of you is to please share the resource. The GPS Parent Series is for everyone, everywhere, near and far. Uh, 50 programs a year, noon and 7 p.m., some hybrid, some in person, um, but always virtual for, for your um for your awareness of these challenging times and uh, the opportunities around raising kids today. So, so glad you could be here. Very quickly, I wanna tell you about some of the upcoming events so you can circle your calendar. Tomorrow, we're gonna to kick off our early childhood series. Dr. Anne Louise Lockhart will be talking about solutions for fear and worry and anxiety in young children at noon and 7 p.m. Next Wednesday, we will be welcoming a very popular uh, podcaster and psychologist, Dr. Becky Kennedy, Good Inside, A Guide to Becoming the Parent You Want to Be. She will be in conversation with Lori Gottlieb, who is the author of You Should Talk to Someone. Uh, the week following, we're going to welcome to a hybrid, uh, Dr. Alima Tu will be talking about anxiety and stress reduction strategies for teens and adults. At noon, we'll be in person at the College of DuPage, also a virtually, and at 7, per, 7 p.m., a virtual program on the 11th. Uh, the week following, we're going to be discussing our community read. Michelle Zahner is a wonderful book, Crying in H Mart. She'll be in conversation with Kelly Corrigan, who has a book called Tell Me More. Uh, so that should be another interesting event. Uh, the rest of the month looks great, too. We'll be hosting uh, Andrew Solomon, uh, Ned Hallowell. So please do find yourself uh, one of these brochures with our 50 programs. And once again, everybody's always welcome. Without further ado, it's my honor to introduce from his car, and he'll tell you all about it, Superintendent Dr. Jeff McHugh of District 41. He'll do the introduction. Take it away, Dr. McHugh. Well, thank you, Gilda. Um, I'm coming to you from my car because uh, up in Lake Zurich, we have no power. So I plan on doing this from my home office, and now I'm doing it from my, uh, my, my mobile office on the road. But I am truly honored here. Thank you, Gilda, and thank you, GPS, for having me introduce um, Dr. Alok Kanogia. Alok Kanogia, MD, MPH, is a Harvard-trained psychiatrist known as Dr. K to his millions of followers. He is one of the foremost experts on video game psychology with firsthand knowledge of this modern issue. He needed professional help to break his own gaming habits in college, an experience that fueled his interest in learning how to help others. He is the author of How to Raise a Healthy Gamer, Break Bad Screen Habits, and Power Struggles, and Transform Your Relationship with Your Kids, which highlights the most recent research from neuroscience and psychology. He is also co-founder of the mental health coaching company, Healthy Gamer. And we are delighted to welcome him to this important GPS event tonight. Dr. K, please take it away. Thank you so much, Dr. McHugh. Uh, and thank you to Gilda and, and Jerrica for having me today. Um, it's an absolute pleasure to be here. I was, you know, I, I did this earlier today. It was a, a blast and I'm looking forward to doing it again. So um, just a little bit about myself. Uh, so I, as Dr. McHugh said, I'm a psychiatrist by training, um, but this is a, a, a topic that is near and dear to my heart because when I was growing up, I struggled with a video game addiction myself. So I, I went to college. Um, I played probably way too much in high school, but managed to kind of scrape by, got accepted to the University of Texas, which is, you know, a, a really solid, great state school, um, and then basically spent my freshman and sophomore year playing video games for like 16 hours a day or more. Um, failed a bunch of classes, uh, got put on academic probation, was really on the the verge of getting kicked out of the school. Um, and my parents had tried kind of everything. So my parents were very loving, very supportive. Um, they're, they're both physicians, actually. So they were like somewhat familiar with issues, I guess, of things like addiction. But I don't think that thought really crossed their mind. Um, 
so they, they tried being very, very tough with me and and even sent me to a military school at, at one point. Um, and then also tried being like very loving and supportive and caring. They kind of tried everything. But the unfortunate truth was that they were kind of outgunned. That if you look at what's happening with technology today, so this was like in the early 2000s where technology wasn't that bad. This was sort of the early days of online gaming, but it was still incredibly addictive. And one of the biggest challenges that I see in the parents that I work with and the kids that I work with um, is, is that the technology is just getting more and more and more addictive. Because if we really look at it, what's going on is we have these multi-billion dollar companies that are sp spending tens of millions, if not hundreds of millions of dollars, investing in gluing your child to the screen. Because right now what's going on is they're competing against each other, right? So like YouTube wants to pull your kid away from TikTok. TikTok wants to pull your kid away from the PlayStation. PlayStation wants to pull your kid away from Netflix. So they're all trying to compete with each other for your child's attention. And they're getting incredibly sophisticated at it. They, they will hire psychologists, behavioral uh, economists. They'll also use tools like AI, all to increase engagement. One of the scariest things is there's a, there's a term in the, in the scientific research now called the attention marketplace. So people are literally doing studies and publishing science about something called the attention marketplace, which is like, how can you get people to focus their attention on your thing? And so what we're seeing is that parents are just outgunned because you as a parent, like we don't know, you know, here we are trying to parent our kid. And the experience of a lot of the parents that I, I talk to are like, this is all they want to do, right? They're like, you know, anytime they have free time, they want to play more. If I ask them, hey, like, do you want to do something else? They'll say, yeah, sure. But anytime they've got a chance to be on the game, that's what they want to do. A lot of parents are luckier in a lot of ways and have done a great job with their kids. So, so, you know, addiction isn't a universal problem. Just to give you all a sense of the statistics. So video game addiction was probably somewhere around 5 or 6%, which is the same as alcohol addiction back in 2010. Um, around 2020, it had ri risen to probably 9 or 10%. And keep in mind that when we're talking about 10% of the population, this is the whole population. And I don't know a whole, whole lot of people who, you know, have uh, AARP discounts that are addicted to video games. So this is 10% of the total population, and it heavily skews towards younger people. Um, the highest rate of addiction in one study, I think somewhere in the Middle East, was about 22%. So we're seeing very, very, very high rates of addiction, and it's ballooning because people are getting way better at addicting your kid. So... What happened in my case is I basically failed out of college. And then my dad was kind of at his wits end. And he said, like, you know, Alok, you need to go to India. And I was like, all right, fine. And thankfully, I listened to him that day because I could tell that there was like, I didn't know what else to do. I was kind of at my wits end, too, because I had tried everything. I had tried, you know, looking at self-help books. I had tried kind of like watching videos online. I tried motivating myself and nothing seemed to work. So I went to India and I discovered yoga and meditation, which I absolutely fell in love with. Um, decided to become a monk, spent about seven years focused on that. And then ultimately, my teachers told me, if you want to take your vows, I, I tried to take my vows at 21. They said, you're not ready. They're very smart over there. Very wise. They said, you can come back, come back when you're 30. And if you want to do it when you're 30, we'll take you. So they were very, very wise. And they recognized that at 21 years old, I was like, I'm ready to give up my life. And I didn't really have a life worth giving up. So like go and live some, you know, go and, and get something that you enjoy in the world. And then if you want to give it up, you can give it up. So uh, it turned out that the monk road didn't really work out. I ended up meeting my wife, going to medical school, um, decided on psychiatry. And then when I was in my second year of psychiatry training, this was back in 2015, started asking some of my mentors who were, or, you know, really experts in the field. So I was lucky enough to train at Harvard Medical School. And so like, you know, my mentors were... Uh, pretty established names in the field. So I would go to these very wise leaders in psychiatry and I would ask them, hey, what do you all think about video game addiction? And it was like something that they were kind of aware of. But in 2015, this was kind of at the height of the opioid crisis in the United States. And that's kind of where their energy was. So people were like, you know, it's good that you want to do this, like we'll support you, but it's not really something that's on anyone's radar right now. So I started working with gamers. I started spending time with presumably your kids. 
Um, because what I sort of found was that there weren't a whole lot of resources out there. I was a gamer myself, still am a gamer, and um, really tried to help them because I, I sort of noticed that like I, you know, it, I started med school at the age of 28. And it, you know, it took me a while. It took me five and a half years to graduate from college because I had so many Fs on my transcript and stuff like that. So gaming had really negatively impacted my life. And so I, I worked really hard to try to help people avoid those kinds of things. And then as I did that work, I started Healthy Gamer um, and I started streaming on Twitch. And if y'all are not familiar with Twitch, it's an online streaming platform where people stream mostly gaming. So I started teaching about video game addiction and mental health on a gaming streaming platform, which one of my colleagues once joked and said, isn't that kind of like holding an AA meeting in a bar? And I said, absolutely, that's a great idea. Because if you really think about it, where do people need Alcoholics Anonymous? Probably in bars. So we got started on Twitch. That's where Healthy Gamer was born. And then we ended up um, working with a lot of gamers and then parents started reaching out to us and asking us for help. So we started, uh, you know, parents would reach out and say, hey, my kid is, um, you know, addicted to video games. I don't know what to do. He won't listen. Can you help him? And we started working with the kids and we started working with the parents. That was about four years ago. And at this point, we've done a couple of different research studies on it. Um, and our program has really been developed and tested. And I'd love to share with you all the basics of what we have found works. Uh, you guys can find all, you know, a, a more detailed kind of week to week plan in how to raise a healthy gamer. But I, I thought I'd kind of give you all the, the basics here today just so, you know, y'all understand. And if y'all are interested, check out the book, whatever. So the core of our program is about building an alliance. So if you kind of look at it, the basic issue that we see in video game addiction in households today is that parent wants the child to stop playing. And the kid doesn't want to stop playing. So this becomes a source of conflict. And the harder that you try to get your kid to stop, the more your child resists you. They start to avoid you. They start to hide away in their room. If you leave the house for a little while, they'll start gaming. So it becomes like this, this almost this game of cat and mouse where you're trying to set boundaries on them. You're punishing them. You're trying to get them to listen. And they're like, they're trying to avoid you at all costs. The most severe case of this that I ever heard was, I got a page one day, right? Because as doctors, we still use pagers, us and drug dealers. And uh, I got a page from someone from Saudi Arabia. And so someone, I, I called the hospital and I was like, what is this weird number? It's like 20 digits. And they're like, no, it's someone from Saudi Arabia. So I called them back and I asked them, I was like, you know, I'm, this is Dr. Kanoja. I'm, I'm returning a call. Who are you? And why are you paging me from halfway across the world? And they said that they'd, they'd sort of watched some of my stuff online and they didn't know what to do with their kid because their kid, what they, what they did is they, things got so severe that they took the power cord from the PlayStation and they locked it up in a cabinet. And when they locked it up in the cabinet, the kid went on YouTube, learned how to pick locks. And at midnight, he would go downstairs, pick the lock, take the power cord, play from midnight till about 5 or 5.30, and then he would lock it back up and then go back to sleep or go to sleep. And so one day his sister wanted a glass of water. She walked downstairs at like three in the morning and she sees him playing like places. She's like, how is this even possible? This is supposed to be locked up. So the basic issue here is that this is not going to work unless your kid wants to play less. Now, this is the point at which most parents say, that's insane. How will my kid ever want to play less? All they want to do is play more. And we would love to help you understand how to get them there, which is absolutely doable. And if y'all don't believe me, just keep in mind that, you know, when I talk about this stuff on the internet, gamers are the ones who are asking me for help. So I'm talking mostly to your kids because kids realize that their life is not going the way that they want it to go. So if you have like a 15 year old kid who's, you know, let's say a freshman in high school. So going through puberty, acne is an issue. They're starting to feel self-conscious and they spend a lot of time playing video games. In the back of their mind, they know that they're not learning how to flirt, that they're not learning how to talk to girls or boys, that they're sort of becoming a little bit, they're not entirely happy with the way that their body is developing. Maybe they're gaining a little bit of weight. They're not quite sure about this stuff, but they don't know what to do about it. They're frightened. And this is what happens with gamers is what happens with us is that once we kind of get off track on life, we continue to get off track. And then we start to fall a little bit behind, we fall further behind, we retreat more and more into the video game, and it becomes a vicious cycle. 
unless y'all are talking about kids that are, I, I know that there's some middle school parents and stuff here today. So like kids that are 10 or 11 may not understand this, but once they hit puberty, they are aware that gaming is negatively impacting their life, right? They want to be successful. They want to be respected. They want to be independent. They want to have money. They want to be impressive. They want to be attractive. Like kids want those things. The problem is once they fall into gaming, they don't think that it's possible to get them anymore. So what we want to do as parents is, first of all, make an alliance with them. Because as long as you're trying to institute some kind of limit, if they're like fighting you every step of the way, it's not going to work. You're going to be exhausted. And this is a, also a very common experience of parents where it's like you have to work so hard every single day to make sure that they're studying and they're, you know, they're they're studying for their test and their project is ready and they have a rough draft of their paper. And you're kind of like nagging them and following them along and, and trying to make sure that everything gets done. But the crazy thing, if you really think about this, is you're not teaching your child independence. You're actually teaching your child dependence. Because what do we do as parents? We make a big mistake. What is the mistake that we make? We love our children and we want to protect them from F's on their transcript. And I say this as someone who has a lot of F's on our transcript. F's are forever, right? And you know that as a parent. You know that if your kid fails a bunch of classes in high school, that that's going to be part of their application to college. You know, it's going to be hard to get into college, hard to find a sponsorship, a uh, scholarship, sorry, et cetera, et cetera, right? So we try to protect our children from the, the mistakes of gaming. And in doing so, we take all of the responsibility and they get to have all the fun because mom and dad are going to make sure that they that everything gets done. I don't need to worry about it. I can just game because mom is going to remind me, right? She's the one who's thinking about it. They're the ones who are being responsible, so I don't have to. So this is a really common dynamic and it needs to change. Because one thing I've learned as an addiction psychiatrist is that you can't be sober for someone else, right? Like... I can try to force my spouse to give up alcohol, but as long as that person wants to drink, they're going to find a way. I tried really hard as an addiction psychiatrist to convince my patients it's not how it works. We, what we really do in addiction psychiatry is cultivate an internal motivation on the part of a patient. And we've taken those evidence-based techniques, we've applied them to video game addiction, and then we started teaching parents how to do it. That's what you'll find in How to Raise a Healthy Gamer. We'll go over the basics today. So the core issue is that y'all need to get on the same team. That's what is the main thing that we're going to be focusing on. Now, before we get there, one of the other things that we found is incredibly helpful, this is what's in part one of the book, is understanding why people play video games. So the reason that games have gotten more and more and more addictive is not just because of dopamine. So dopamine is great. It's a pleasure chemical, gets released in the nucleus accumbens gives us a sense of satisfaction and enjoyment and all that behavioral reinforcement and all that other good stuff. And everyone's kind of focused on dopamine. But what we found, if you look at the development of video games over the last 15 years, is that they start to activate other circuits of the brain. So back when I was growing up, you know, we used to have these games called role-playing games. And in role-playing games, you make a character and you explore a world and then the game ends. You beat the game. I don't know if y'all remember this, but maybe when some of y'all were growing up, we could beat games. You could finish a game and it would be over. That's no longer the case, right? The games never end. You can always play more. There are always expansions. They're always releasing content. There's always a new version. So games stopped ending. But then the other thing that game developers figured out, and I don't think that this was nefarious. I don't think they were trying to addict our children. They just thought about what would make a game more fun. Well, a game would be way more fun if you could play it with your friends, right? Makes sense. So they started creating communities. They started creating a social aspect to games. We can form guilds. We have friend lists, friends lists. We have voice chat. You can make friends with people across the internet. I started playing games with a guy named Error. That was his online name. Um, when I was 15 years old, never met the guy, played games with him for 13 years. And then the first time I met him was when I invited him to my wedding. So the relationships that we form through the internet are absolutely real. They're, they can't replace real life relationships, but there's a component of them that's absolutely real. You can form a connection. You can have an empathic bond with someone. And so what happened is a game developer started 
looking at all these like psychological, I mean, this is not the way they did it, but they started looking at what makes a game more fun, what makes it more engaging. And what they ended up doing is taking advantage of various psychological needs that human beings have. So human beings have a need for social connection, and we can get that through a game now. Human beings have a sense of identity, and we want to feel proud of ourselves. We dress a particular way. We fix our hair a particular way. And someone realized one day when they were developing a video game, hey, how about we let someone customize their character? If you look at games from 20 years ago, like, you know, you play as the protagonist and the protagonist is fixed. Then we started adding cosmetics. You can pick your gender. You can pick your name. You can pick your hair color. You can pick whatever you want to. So we started creating tiny little virtual versions of ourselves. So they sort of tapped into this human being's desire to develop their identity. Another thing that happened is games started being very, very accomplishment focused. So we, you know, raise our kids to be accomplished, right? And, and I know that none of y'all are tiger parents and you're very loving and supportive and all that good stuff. But we want our kids to do a good job. We teach them the value of doing a good job, right? Don't half-ass things. You should try your best. It's good if you win a trophy. We're going to celebrate. If you get straight A's, we're going to reward you. We teach them the value of accomplishment. The problem is that all of the lessons that we teach them, video games hijack. Because now when you play a game for a day, you get this, some meter fills up and then you hear a little ding and then there's this little like, you know, this little celebration and you get a trophy and then you get some kind of achievement. So if you look at games, games will reward every step of the way. The game is constantly telling your kid, hey, you did a good job. Hey, this is progress. Hey, you're almost at your next goal. You just need to play one more round and you'll get closer. There's something that you can unlock here. And then if you play for another hour, you can unlock. And if you play for 10,000 hours, you get to unlock this very special thing. And if you think about what your kid does during the week, what they do during the week, how can it compete with this beautiful trophy system and achievement system and progress system? I studied for my math test. It is Tuesday at seven o'clock. I studied for my math test. Where's my trophy? I have to study tomorrow. I have to study the next day. I have to study the next day. And then I finally take my math test. Then a week later, I get my math test back. I see an A. I feel really good. I bring it home. I show it to my parents. And let's be honest, your kids are taking like, you know, 10 tests every couple months. So how much can we celebrate each one? And by the way, even though we're celebrating the A on your math test today, you've got a paper due in two days. So that's what you should be focused on. So the real world doesn't reward effort the way that a video game does. Sure, the video game is fake completely agree. But the whole point of gaming uh, game development is that they do things in a way where there are parts of your brain that cannot tell the difference. So if you're looking at, at a kid and you're trying to wonder, like, how is this person spending so much time playing this game? It's because there are parts of their brain that have been wired to accomplish things that are being activated. So in part one of the book, what we really focus on is teaching y'all as parents what are the fundamental psychological and neuroscientific needs that are activated by gaming? Because our approach is that as long as your child is not getting those needs met outside of the game, they will be addicted to the game. So our approach is to build a life that is worth living. And oftentimes what parents will do is they'll kind of do it kind of like throwing spaghetti at a wall where we're like, okay, you need to exercise, you need to get physically healthy, you need to be social, you need to learn an instrument, right? I'm a parent, I have a seven-year-old and nine-year-old, and they're both projects and I'm trying to turn them into the perfect children. And so this is what we end up doing, right? We're like, oh, you got to do this, this, but we're not targeted. We think this is like healthy, we aren't well-rounded children, no? like well-rounded round. So this is what we do. But we don't realize that our child is addicted to the game because there is a particular problem in life. That I'm 15 years old or I'm 16 years old and a couple of my friends have girlfriends, but I feel embarrassed. I don't like the way that I look. I don't know how to dress. I've got acne. And then all of those problems and then I feel embarrassed. I'm bullied in school. And then all those problems disappear if I play a video game. Because on the video game, no one judges, no one even sees my face. So I don't need to be embarrassed about the way that I look. Instead, what I can do is create an avatar of myself that is sexy, right? Looks great, 
I can customize it. All I have to do is a click of a button and I can change the way that my appearance is. And we start to identify with this. So the, the key thing to understand is we have to we have to really figure out what is it about the game that your child is getting addicted to because it's way more than dopamine. This is why they become more addicted. So once parents are armed with that information, that alone can be incredibly helpful because it will help you target how to get them off of the game. Now we know, okay, my kid struggles with confidence, so let's develop a plan to help them build confidence and confidence in the way that they look and confidence about their you know, appearance and their ability to socialize. Let's work on social skills. Then we can build targeted plans and something beautiful happens. When we build targeted plans like this, the kids are on board because this is what they're unsatisfied with in the rest of the world, right? In the real world. So we have an event that we run every Valentine's Day on the, on the Healthy Gamer Discord, which has about 100,000 gamers. And ramping up to Valentine's Day, we do something called Social Sandbox, where about we get up, get into groups of about 200 people, and we practice asking each other out on dates. And it's cool. It's like our favorite, like our, our most celebrated event, or one of our most celebrated community events for the year, because people want to learn how to socialize. They just don't feel safe. And I don't know if you all remember what it's like to be a teenager and, and ask people out on dates. It's like very terrifying, right? It's so easy to get rejected. And then we have this online world where I don't have to expose myself to any of that. I can make these friends online and I never have to face my problems. So oftentimes your children want their real lives to be better. They just don't know how to get there. And if we present, it's not about restricting gaming. It's about what do you want to accomplish in life? Let me help you. So this, is, this moves us to step two, which is building an alliance. So this kind of goes back to this concept of like, you can't be sober for someone else. Your kid needs to want to res not re even restrict or reduce. Your kid has to be willing to sacrifice their gaming for other things. Then the two of y'all are going to be on the same team. Then y'all will be working together. Then if you really think about, you know, if you're struggling with gaming at home or devices at home, the real challenge is not the device. It's your kid. Your kid doesn't cooperate. And so the moment that we get you and the kid on the same team, suddenly all of the energy that you are putting into overcoming their resistance they're moving in one direction, and you can dump even half of that energy in the same direction, and we see great results. So how do we build an alliance? This is where we say a lot of things that parents are unhappy with, because you all have to remember, I am a gamer, which means I'm on your kid's team. So the first thing that we're going to do is not make any changes to their gaming for one month. We're not going to restrict anything more than it is right now. You don't have to, you know, if you've May set limits, you can keep them, but we're not going to make anything worse. Now, parents get really confused by this. They're like, when does the gaming get cut back? I don't, I'm confused. How does this work? So instead, what we're going to do, we're going to do something really strange. We're going to talk to our children. We're just going to spend a month getting to understand what they like about the gaming. Right. So like this is how we, we kind of offer sample dialogue. And this is kind of what we do in our coaching program. We'll kind of talk people through this. So we'll, we'll give you all some examples here. So, you know, we sit our kid down and we say, hey, look. I recognize that I've been very harsh with you about gaming. I know that I have all these reasons that I keep on trying to convince you about. Right. Because I'm being harsh because I'm right. No. Right. I'm right. That's why I'm doing it. I do it because I love you. So we're not going to go into our reasons. We're going to say, hey, I just realized I don't really understand what's going on. I don't understand what you like about the game. I don't understand what the rest of your life is like. And it occurs to me as a parent, like, I should maybe start by trying to understand what you like about video games. And what I'd love to do over the next month is talk to you about that. And I'm not going to make any changes based on what you say, at least for a month, okay? So there are a couple of important points here. The first is that kids are reluctant to talk to us. And why? You can look at your kid and you're like, you know this is a problem. I know this is a problem. I know you could be using your time in more productive ways. You know you could be using your time in more productive ways. But anytime you try to tell them that, they resist you. They don't resist you because you're wrong. They resist you because you're right. Because if they ever agree... They're giving you ammo to take the game away, and they don't want to take the game away. So they have to, like, be in denial. It's crazy. 
So what we want to do to disarm that denial, disarm that resistance is, hey, let's just talk. Like, help me understand what's going on. So over the course of four weeks, we recommend that you sit down with your kid for about one hour a week and you just talk to them because right now they're not even talking to you about the games. The other thing that we really need to change is the dynamic of conversation around gaming in the household. Because chances are most parents, and if you're not doing this, good for you, you're off to a great start. Most of the time, our, our conversations are very contentious, right? We're like, hey, stop playing. Hey, I told you to, I told you to get ready. You're not ready yet. You needed to be ready 30 minutes ago. It's bedtime. It's dinner time. Did you do your uh, book report? Did you do your book report? Did you do your book report? I can't believe you're not, you're playing games again. You're playing games again. It's always contentious. There's no way to talk about gaming without it being contentious. Because the only time we talk about gaming is when we try to get them to stop. So then what happens if you ever try to talk to your kid about gaming? They are do shut down because they've been trained to be on the defensive anytime it comes up. So for one month, you let them know, hey, not going to make any changes. I just like to understand. Now, the other part of that is that, you know, we want to tell them that at some point, you know, at the end of this, I may make changes, right? I may institute some limits, some boundaries. I would love it if you were a part of that process. So instead of me unilaterally making decisions about what's right or wrong for you, Instead, what we really want to do is understand what you like about gaming, what's going on in the rest of your, your life, and then hopefully we can figure out some kind of plan that moves you in the direction that you want to go. So over the course of these conversations, what we're, re we're really looking for is for the psychological needs in part one, which of those psychological needs is your child the most vulnerable to? What are they afraid of in the real world? Why is engaging in the real world hard for them? And once we understand what those targets are, these are the things that matter to your child. But getting them to open up to you requires a, a greater sophistication of communication. So part two is all about certain communication skills. Now, why do we need more social uh, sophistication of our communication skills? Because our kids are not as good at talking as we were. So if we sort of think about the way that we learn how to parent, like how do you, how did you learn how to talk to your kids? Chances are you learned some of it from your parents and they learned some of, of it from their parents, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. We learn a lot of our parenting from our parents. Now, if you're here at, at the GPS series for this, chances are you're not just taking what your parents taught you and applying that because y'all are in the minority of actually doing the work to try to be a better parent. So kudos to you. So y'all are already off on, on, on the right start. But the other problem that's going on is that no parenting generation in the history of humanity has ever had to deal with addiction at the age of two. So most of the time, right, like when I was a teenager, my parents were like, Alok, no drinking, no smoking. That was the talk that I got when I was like 15. So we start to think about things like addictions and teaching our kids about alcohol and nicotine and marijuana and stuff like when they hit puberty, right? When they start to get a little bit sneaky. So we, we don't really think about like protecting our kids from addiction and like you see it, right? When you like when you well, when I'm at the grocery store and I'm pushing my cart, I'll see some kid on an iPad. Like I've been guilty of that. My kid used to be on an iPad when I was going down the grocery store. And we see it, like there's addictive stuff all around them. And we don't really realize, I think we're starting to realize as a society that this is a problem. But this is new for y'all. The other thing that's going on is your kids have a social skills atrophy because they communicate so much on the internet. They lose the ability to understand body language. They lose the ability to understand tone. They're texting all the time. Nonverbal communication. Some of these skills of empathy are underdeveloped. That's why we practice asking people out on dates during Valentine's Day, because that's what your kids need. They need practice for social skills. In the absence of that kind of practice, what you unfortunately have to do because you're the parent, right, is you have to make up for where your child has a shortfall. So we have to teach you all a new set of dialogue skills. So our core foundational skills are something called open-ended questions and reflective listening. These are also evidence-based techniques that we use in addiction psychiatry. So when I'm trying to get my patient to stop smoking, I don't tell them, hey, bro, do you know that smoking is going to kill you one day? Doesn't work. Instead, what we want to do is we want to encourage them to 
articulate the answers themselves. So there's a, and oftentimes the way that we talk to our kids, we talk to our kids very instructionally. Hey, you should do this. Why do we talk like that? Because we're parents. And because when your kid was two, you had to tell them we don't put, we don't put the knife in our mouth, right? We have to teach them because they're like two. And then we develop this communication style that most parents will start to adapt in their teenage years, but we need to do a little bit more. So once addiction enters the pic picture, once social skills atrophy enters the picture, we want to start asking open-ended questions. Tell me about your gaming. What do you like about gaming? How is the rest of your life? Or you can't say, how is the rest of your life going? That's a terrible question. Tell me a little bit about school. What do your friends like to do? Do you have trouble making friends? What's your social life like? So we want to ask a lot of what questions that are not yes or no questions. So we just want to get them talking. Second thing that we want to do is something called reflective listening. So when they say something, we want to just repeat it back in, in our own words. So, oh, it's, so what's, what's your social life like at school? They're like, you, you know, your kid says, oh, like, you know, all my friends play games. Okay, so it sounds like you're part of the group that plays games. Yeah. Tell me about the other groups. What do you think about them? They're not my friends. I don't like them. Do, you don't like them, fair enough. Do they like you? Ah, oh, dad, mom, oh, oh my God. Can we stop talking about this? Sure. Right, so we wanna start getting them to open up a little bit when we use reflective listening, right? We, we demonstrate a lot of compassion and empathy. If we get a little bit too close to something that's a sore spot, we can even reflect that back and say, Hey, so I'm, you know, I, I see that I asked you a question that maybe you're not comfortable answering. I'm sorry. You know, I'll be more careful in the future. And then we kind of let it go. So, so a lot of these conversations around gaming addiction can't be done. Like, you know, you know, you can't do it like all over the course of one day. It needs to be a little bit like baking bread. Like we add the yeast and we have to let the dough rise slowly. It takes a lot of time. So have conversations with your kid once or twice a week for about one month, just about how their life is going. Try to understand what they like about games, what they like, what's what their struggles are. What are you struggling with, right? Being a teenager can be hard. What are you struggling with? If you ask, are you struggling? What are you going to get? No, everything's fine. That's a yes or no question. What are you struggling with? And they may say nothing, right? So we'll, we walk through all those particular pathways in the book. So a big part of it is building an alliance. And at the end of that month, hopefully what will happen is that these kids will start to like, you know, open up some, you understand like what their goals are, what they're struggling with. And then we get to boundary setting. So boundary setting is when we, the, this is the part that the parents love. It's the part where they play less games. But this too is structured in a completely different way. Because what we want to do is build that alliance. We want to understand what is important to your child. And then we start to build our gaming habits around solving their problems. So if your kid, you know, is concerned about their weight, then let's think about what can we do to help you feel more comfortable with your weight, right? Would you like to go to the gym? Would you like to learn how to cook? Would you like to do this? And the other thing is that we give you a lot of guidance about letting them be in the driver's seat. What do you want to do about this problem? Do you want me to help you? Do you want me to come up with options and then you pick something? Or do you want to do research on your own? These kids are very good at Googling things nowadays. It's crazy. It's like they were born with the internet around. So we want to sort of pick something that matters to them. And then the beautiful thing is that once we pick something that matters to them, when we start to structure their day, their week around that thing, the resistance to gaming restriction goes down. Because if we're going to cooking class three times a week or we're going to the gym three times a week, those are three times that we're not playing games, right? Those are three hours or more, probably there's a little bit of a commuting time. So 90 minutes, three times a week where they're not playing games. And then what we do is we kind of reflect on that, right? So, hey, like you've cut back on your gaming by like four or five hours. How do you feel about that? How do you, would you have rather been gaming for five hours or gone to the gym for, you know, three or four hours this week? What do you, what would you prefer? And then it's crazy. Your kids will say like, yeah, like I don't need to, you know, cutting back on five hours is like not that big of a deal. And I'm super happy that I'm working out. This is un overwhelmingly the, the response that we get. So we teach a lot of these sort of techniques around boundary setting. 
We teach a lot of techniques about sort of taking what they're what they want and starting to help them build a life. Right. And it's beautiful, like what we see from these parents, because they do this. OK, we did the gym for about a month. Do you want to do something else? Right. Do you want to learn how to fish? Do you want to learn how to dance? Do you want to learn how to sing? And they're so embarrassed to even tell you this stuff. And then they're starting to build this life. Are you struggling to make friends? Like, what can we do about that? Let's work on it together. Now you're a part of their team. It's about their goals. And one of the most common questions I get is, what is a healthy gamer? And that's the goal of this whole program and, and what we'd encourage you all to do. Right. So I'm I'm not like in the abstinence camp. So there's a there's a camp of people who believes that, you know, we should stop gaming. I think it's a part of the world. I, I, I did a workshop at Google uh, uh, some time ago and, you know, they have like gaming systems like in the office. It's crazy. Right? This is the way that people socialize. It's the way that sometimes I've I've seen weddings for people who met online in World of Warcraft. They'll have a virtual wedding and they'll have a real wedding. So the world is changing. And it's our job to prepare our kids for technology that is increasingly invasive, right? We have to teach them how to be safe around this stuff. We have to teach them restraint instead of restriction. The default mode for a lot of parents is to restrict. I'm going to take this away from you. Why? Because it's hurting you. And you know that as a parent. You can see it. But when we take the game away from the kid, we're not teaching the kid how to be safe around fire. We're just preventing them from ever seeing fire. And I think that's not, that doesn't work as well, in my opinion. And I think that you have to remember that, you know, 10 years from now, social media is going to be worse. Technology is going to be worse. Everything's going to be more addictive. People are getting better and better and better at addicting your kids and you, by the way. You know, the average use uh, amount of cell phone use per day for the average American is four hours and 37 minutes. That's not just your kids. That's us. We take our phones to the toilet. We use our phones every time we're on the elevator, when we're sitting in traffic, whatever, right? That's what we do before bed when we wake up in the morning. And we do it because we have to work, <laughs> right? So what it means to be a healthy gamer is we take all of those psychological needs and we're fulfilling them in the real world. We don't need the game to give us a social life. We don't need the game to give us a sense of identity. We don't need the game to give us a sense of accomplishment. To have a full life and then have gaming where it belongs, which is recreation. And that's really what we shoot for. And what the community that we've tried to build online is for people who agree with that, right? They come to me and they say, Dr. K, help us stop playing games. And I'm like, you have to have a reason, bro. What's the alternative? There's nothing else in your life. You just stop playing games and then you're not doing anything all day. No, build something. Go and do something. And so this is what we advocate y'all do with your kids. And as you start helping them build a life that is worth living, the gaming will actually reduce on its own, which is what's so crazy for a lot of parents. Now, a couple of problems that we have to talk about. One is that, you know, for a lot of parents, this is really hard. One is that you're seeing your, the impact of gaming or technology on your child, and you want to fix it fast. So we're not a quick fix. I would say we see some progress within two to three months. And on average, it takes people about six months to two years to really get their kid in the right place. The lucky ones are, are really doing a lot better in six months. Most people, about a year is what it takes. And then for some people, two years or even more. Because that's what it takes. Like, I don't, I don't know how to say this, but doing addiction psychiatry work, like sobriety is not, you're not done in like three months, four months, right? It takes years usually. The good news is that with the right kind of guidance, with the right information, when you as a parent is, are equipped, understanding what's going on in your kid's brain, understanding what's going on in your kid's psychology, having communication skills that are buffed up understanding how to build an alliance, getting on the same team, really winning them over, and then learning a lot about the science of boundary setting. Because there are a lot of challenging situations that we talk about. One great example is divorced households or separated households, split households. So one parent is like, hey, I think the gaming is a problem. You have trouble convincing your ex that it's a problem, right? Your ex is like, eh, it's just a phase. So you institute all of these limits, and then when they go over to your ex's house, 
They get to do whatever they want. And so then parents come to me and they're like, I don't know what to do about this. And that's why our focus is win over the kid. Once the kid is won over, they will continue their own things when they go to the, the second household. Right? They're like, hey, I have martial arts class three days a week. Can you pick me up and drop me off? And the parents will probably, if your, parent, if, if your ex is kind of hands off, right, they'll be like, sure, why not? So there are a lot of things that we kind of talk about. There are a lot of challenges that parents run into. It's not as simple as what I'm saying. It's actually way harder than what I'm saying. And then the last part of the book is actually about mental health diagnoses, because oftentimes gaming is a symptom of a deeper problem. So as a parent, how can you recognize things like ADHD, marijuana addiction, autism spectrum? What does depression look like in your kid? And we give some guidance about fixing that as well. Not fixing that, but like how to approach that. Because what happens is anytime you have some something else going on, oftentimes all of your efforts on the gaming won't work because there's something else fueling it. So if they're depressed and they have, you know, they don't feel joy, it's going to be very hard for them to form social connections. It's going to feel hard for them to feel accomplished. And then what they try to do is they try to fast forward their days. This is what I did, right? I'm just going to play games until my mood somehow magically gets better. So we offer a lot of guidance because we've seen that parents need that information as well. So we're going to open it up to questions. Last thought that I kind of last conclusion that I have before we do that is, you know, gaming is incredibly invasive and I get it. And I think the reason that it has grown so quickly is because parents, we're the first line of defense. And we, we don't know what we're dealing with, right? Because we didn't have to, unless you're like me, you didn't grow up dealing with a video game addiction. And so a lot of this is happening because we as parents have been kind of caught off guard. And what we found is actually once you like understand what you're dealing with, we see excellent outcomes from a lot of parents and their kids. So don't lose hope. We just haven't been fighting back. Mm -hmm. Oh, this is wonderful. Um, such important information. Um, you know, like, as you've noted in the book as well, step one, understanding the brain, understanding the games, understanding your gamer. Step two, form an alliance. Uh, use those good communication skills, open-ended questions, being curious um, to, uh, to talk to gamer and, and to have that conversation while you are you've not made any changes for one month's time don't become more restrictive don't become more lenient uh keep the schedule as is then step three acting on what you know um and then forming that alliance that that relationship so that they know that you're not the enemy that you're going to figure this out together how did i do perfect okay we didn't talk very much about step four, but just for a moment, can we just talk about depression for a minute? Um, the elevators, okay, about that. Yeah, so so let's understand this, okay? So when we're, we're doing addiction psychiatry work, we have this concept called dual diagnosis. And dual diagnosis means that if someone has depression and let's say like addiction to alcohol, you cannot treat these one at a time. So if we think about what is the role of alcohol, alcohol numbs us to our negative mood. The problem is even though it numbs us temporarily, it actually worsens the mood over time. So as we feel more depressed, our desire for alcohol increases. As we drink more, our mood gets worse, which then requires us to have more alcohol. So if you focus on the depression by itself, what you'll find is that the alcohol is like sabotaging your efforts. If you try to treat the addiction on its own, you'll find that the depression is fueling the addiction. So this is why it's really important for parents to understand like the role of like mental health and how it could view a uh, fuel gaming addiction. Now with mm -hmm. depression specifically, there's a couple of interesting things. One is that, you know, if you think your kid is like cranky or moody, that can be what depression looks like. It doesn't have to be. It's, you know, if it feels like beyond kind of your, your standard teenager kind of angst, I would strongly consider getting an evaluation. I think a big part of seeing a professional is not about treatment. It's about evaluation. Mm -hmm. um, and just trust your instinct as a parent. And sometimes depression, especially in teenagers and kids, can look like anger, frustration, and tantrums as opposed to like sadness or crying. 
Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I won't spend much more time on step four, but just for a minute about ADHD and how that the linkage to gaming. Yeah. So kids with ADHD are incredibly vulnerable to video game addiction. And if you kind of think about it, right, so the, the real world is not really designed for your child's mind to be engaged. So we force our kids to sit in school. Um, you know, we have like these textbooks, which are very unengaging. And if you literally look at like what video games are, right? So video games have lots of lights, lots of sounds, lots of colors. Kids with ADHD can play video games for 12 hours at a stretch because their brain gets the stimulation that they need to in order to stay focused. The other thing that I'd say is that if you kind of think about it, right? The times in your life when sometimes you feel the best are when you're super focused, when you get lost in a novel, when you're binge watching a, a show, when you're walking on the beach and enjoying a sunset, you know, when the, the leaves are changing color, like focus of the mind is very, very peaceful. The challenge with a lot of ADHD kids is that if you look at like their experience of the world, it's not peaceful. You're always late. You're always forgetting things. You panicked because you, you left your homework at home, but you didn't actually leave it at home. It's in your backpack but you didn't have the focus to be able to notice it there. So then you call your mom and then they're mad at you and they look for it and everyone's stressed out. This is their experience day to day. And then you compare and contrast that to a video game where like they understand exactly what's going on. The game tells you where to go. It's engaging. You can be focused. You can be good. You can be exceptional. I do some works, work with esports professionals. Rate of ADHD diagnosis is maybe between five and 10% in the general population. If you are a professional gamer, 30% of them have ADHD. It may even be a competitive advantage in the world of streaming and gaming. It's a huge intersection there. Hmm, interesting. Uh, here's a question. Um, how do you think teachers can use these techniques in a classroom full of many children at the same time? Yeah, so the first thing is like, I hate to say this. I don't know if you can. I'm going to give you an answer. But the last thing that I would want to assume, because I've seen how hard teachers struggle, it's really hard. So your mileage really may vary, but I still think I've, I've seen teachers implement this. There are a lot of teachers in our community, actually. So I think the right way to approach it is to have a conversation with the kids in your classroom. Ask them like, hey, what are we doing here? Right? What's the point of y'all coming to school? I know y'all have been forced here. But here we are telling you to put your cell phones and stuff away. Like, what do you gain from one hour on your cell phone? You know, like you browse TikTok for 30 hours a week. Like, what is the call? Like, is 29 versus 30? Are you going to watch like that many TikToks and it's going to be great? So when I teach, I do something a little bit unusual. Different because I, I almost never teach high schoolers. I did a couple weeks ago. So first thing that I tell them is pull out your phones, pull out your laptops, pull up your favorite, favorite you know, shopping website or whatever. And then it's my job as the teacher to try to engage you. I don't think y'all can do that. <laughs> but I think if really pointing out to them that, look, like, let's understand why we're in school. I'm going to do my best to make it worth your while. And I think even asking open-ended questions about what is working with you, what is working in class and what is not working in class. Tell me what y'all like. It's my job to teach you. It's my responsibility. It's your responsibility to learn. How can we meet somewhere in the middle around this? Got it. So we know that uh, it's very important to have these conversations with your child. And I know there's a question here about uh, the ch suggestions, challenges for my, my child who's not making this easy. Uh, in what way are they not making it easy? I'm, I'm... Um, when I try to engage them in conversation, uh, I'm hitting a brick wall. Yeah, so I think this is where like, signaling to them that, hey, I would like to talk to you about this. I think it's important to talk. I would like to understand. And then signaling to them as well that like, I'm not trying to understand or punish you. This isn't a conversation about punishment. I'm not going to try to catch you. This is like, I want to understand. And then at the end of a month, I'm going to do the best that I can. So I'm writing the legislation. I'm writing the regulations. Do you want to write it with me? And when you kind of give them that choice, oftentimes they almost always will engage with you in some way. That combined with some of the evidence-based techniques about getting people to open up usually does the trick. 
there's actually also a specific chapter about resistance and where resistance comes from and how to deal with resistance. Okay. Um, here's a question. How can you talk about how much parents should have their other adult child help raise and support their gamer children? Is that clear to you? Yeah, absolutely. So, so, um, you know, a lot of the people who come to us are actually siblings. So siblings will say like, Hey, like this is a problem. Mm -hmm. Um, so I, I, it's oftentimes the siblings because even the parents are like, kind of like sometimes they can be y'all aren't but i think a lot of the parents can be a little bit clueless especially like me like if you're if your parents were like first generation immigrants they're not quite aware of some of this stuff um so children can be very involved so i think that's where once again i think it's about a conversation i would not place the responsibility on your other adult children but i think having them be involved in the conversation they can also be a very useful support for your kid because they know what gaming presumably is like a little bit more. Um, your your child may feel more comfortable talking to a sibling than they do with a parent, especially around issues around romance or sexuality or, or things like that. Um, so, so I think they can absolutely be a part of the conversation. And at the same time, I think that you as the parent should still be kind of the point person because the goal is for you to build an alliance with your kid. A uh, question for you. What is different from when you started this work to where we are today? Oh, so much. Um, so I, I think the biggest thing that I've learned that I was very surprised at is once you start working in the right way, how little effort is required. Mm. So when you think about, you know, like sometimes like the other day, my kid was trying to get I don't know if you guys have ever had this problem, but they're trying to get a square box lid on top of a box. And you know, this is the kind of thing where if you slide it on perfectly, it goes right on. But if it's even at a slight angle, you can push as hard as you want. It'll never go on. And she was getting frustrated and she was pounding it and she was squeezing it. And it's just about the force applied in the right way reduces the amount of force required. And the biggest thing that I've seen is that once we understand, because if you really think about parenting, what makes parenting hard? What makes parenting hard is when you don't understand what's going on. Once you figure out what's going on with your kid, once you understand, oh, they're like mildly allergic to cats. Once you realize, you know what, they just need some time, some space, and I need to let them come to me. Once you understand, then parenting becomes easy. And so that's true of gaming, too. You've got some uh, middle school parents here. You've got some high school parents. Anything specific that you need to say to, that each of those two groups? Yeah, so I think that th this is uh, important to understand, but the more aware your child is, the more our stock approach works well. Ah, so okay. generally speaking, you know, when you've got like a 10-year-old, they don't have goals in life. They don't feel like they're falling behind. Like that kind of stuff really works better once you've got a teenage kid, right? Where you talk to them about their hopes and dreams and all that good stuff. The younger your kid is, you can still use a lot of these techniques, but it may be a little bit less abstract. And it's even like really simple stuff like, okay, what do you enjoy the most about gaming? You have to do some of this other stuff. And then really trying to help them figure out, okay, if you enjoy like, you know, staying up late and playing with your friends, you can do that on Friday night. You can do that on Saturday night. But during the week, I want you to do this. On weeks where you do everything that you're going to do, I'm going to order pizza for you. Your friends can come over. Y'all can have a slumber party. And then y'all can do, you know, y'all can game in, until the mi middle of the night. So I, I think oftentimes you can work with your kids who are a little bit younger. Um, but the way that you have to work with them is a little bit different. And we kind of have a chapter about what we call pre-insight and post-insight, which means mm -hmm. does is your child aware of the impact of gaming? And mm -hmm. if they're not aware, we have to modify some of what we do. If they mm -hmm. are aware, uh, it, it works pretty well. Girls and boys differences? Some, although I think that this methodology works for also things like social media addiction and stuff like that. Um, we know that from a we know from a gender perspective that girls get addicted to different kinds of games. So their likelihood to get addicted to social games is way higher. And but that's basically covered. So since we go through so like the book is like written for boys and girls. So we we work with both those groups and we've it's already kind of baked in. So the, the psychological needs that they get met are a little bit different, a little bit more social, whereas 
uh, boys like dominance winning accomplishment a little bit more. Dr. McHugh, do you have a closing comment or a question? Um, that storm that hit you is now coming our way too. So, oh, but there you are. Go ahead. Hey. Yeah, uh, it's take shelter. It's going to be wet, wet and wild. A, a lot of wonderful questions. I just had one final question, Dr. K. Um, if a child, I love the idea of replacing their behavior, but what if their best friends are also gamers? Mm. Any advice for your child getting an alliance with those friends, if that is where they want to spend all their time? Yeah, so, and, so a great question. So I want y'all to understand this. The reason this is a problem is because your child has allies, but you don't. So it's your child against, with all of his or her friends, against you as a solo parent. That's never going to work. What we need is allies. So talk to your child's friend's parents. Hey, what do you think about your gaming? Hey, these kids are always, they're always complaining. They always tell me, oh, but this kid gets to play. What do y'all think about setting some common limits? And when parents do this, the kids are terrified. They're so scared of this happening because the only, the, what they get away with is, right, like they'll manipulate y'all. And they'll figure out who's the weakest link in the armor. And they'll always go over to that person's house. So getting involved with your kids' parents, right? Generally speaking, a healthy thing to do anyway, is like, we're going to fight fire. We're not going to play at a disadvantage. Everyone gets the same number of people on the team. Like, so work with your kids' friends' parents. Good advice. Thank you so much, Dr. K, for Thank this you. time that you have spent with us today. You've been so generous with us. Uh, and we've learned so much. Uh, tomorrow night, it's anxiety and young children. And please share this resource and uh, take advantage of this wonderful opportunity. Dr. Cape, a great evening. Dr. McHugh, thank, you, thank so you so much from your car. So glad to have everybody here tonight. This is where we go hug the kids, Dr. K. So we're going to go awesome. do that right now. Go do that. Okay. Thank you so right, much. Take care. Bye. Great evening, everyone. See you next time.